code works it would be more of uh, you know scribbler work as well as it would be more of uh, discussions right so i since both of you have been working in quite a senior position i would look also look forward to the inputs from your end so it would not be a very one sided discussion so i need to build into i need to build into bridges before uh, right at the point when i start uh, shooting off right so first is one end i have talked about sas and the discussion is still in progress on the other hand yes i'll come to that so uh, on the other hand what happens is we have statistics and on the other hand i have crm so i actually have these three different techniques or these three different branches to pull in together at one part right so the question so first of all as opm you rightly pointed out through his last question to me that can you please let us know the broad topics that we'll cover in crm so precisely that is the part that we would first of all do but before doing that we need to understand the broad topics so if you look into the syllabus right you will get to see the broad topics together right and everything is jotted down there but there has been a story which runs across these three uh, across the different sections so for doing that the first thing we need to understand is that first of all we need to define the usage and the scope of the risk model development module about this credit risk model development module why this credit risk is it only for uh, is it only a product on the tech lab role which helps people to move across jobs is it that or is there something more to this entire concept so that is what we need to first of all explore right and this is where uh, we, we need to understand or the role that banks play in an economy now myself being an economic student i always tend to understand or try to grasp things from the side of economics right so first of all i talk about two things one the roles that banks play in an economic and help in economic development second why risk model so basically it has been if i uh, actually go back right if, if i start going back in history you would see that banks have ever since played a, a, a i mean the biggest role or maybe the most significant role in the economic development of the nation as well as they have always played the most significant role why you know uh bringing about the biggest of the crisis so most the biggest of the crises that, that the globe has ever faced has mostly been due bank failures i don't say all but most so if i go back so what what exactly is the role that a bank actually does so traditionally speaking banks as financial institution are responsible for creating you know they are responsible for uh, developing or or developing a channel or developing yes a developing a platform through which credit can be channeled so there are so there is always a demand for credit and there is always a supply for credit in an economy now, the supply for credit in an economy are the households so i take my money and i want deposit in the bank i love to see my bank balance grow on the other hand what i have is the demand for funds so what the bank does the bank gives me an interest on that money now, had i not kept that money in the bank i would have kept it out with me so in the jargon of economics i say that i am bearing an opportunity cost so i am actually foregoing a few present consumption and i am creating an opportunity for a future consumption and i'm keeping the money in the bank and the bank is giving me an interest so the question that comes out is where is the bank giving that interest from how is that money uh, like multiplicating how is the money increasing that they can give me an interest so what the bank does is the bank is lending out the money to people who require the money right so they are actually lending out to the in the, to the entrepreneurs they are lending out to the business community to the households who need credit so basically the so 
credit is coming down to the bank and the bank is disbursing the credit and the bank is charging a rate of interest on that. Now, when the bank is doing that, the bank is actually operating between two different segments. One is a low risk segment, which is the households where we are keeping the money with the bank and their money uh, and the bank is paying them a deposit rate of 3%, 3.3.5%, 4%, whatever it is. That's the Indian standards. And I'm getting my deposit on my savings account. Or I create a fixed deposit. Or I create a term deposit, any demand deposit, whatever I'm doing, but I'm depositing the money with the bank. The bank is using that money from the low risk segment to and lending out to the high risk segment. So this is the primary function that banks perform. And in between these two segments, the bank is earning an interest rate differential, creating an interest, uh, 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 it's earning an interest differential through it, it's making a profit. So that's the business of the bank at a very high level. Now, the story seems very good, right? I put my money over there. I get an interest at the end of the day. The bank lends that money out. The bank makes a killer, more killing profit, more, um, more killing earning, gives me my interest amount. And in between, he earns a profit and he moves on. So that's a very good story, end to end story. But this story is good as long as the person who is taking the loan has been a good person and he has been benevolent enough or diligent enough to return the money back to the bank. Now, what if the person doesn't pay back the money? I take the money from the bank and I don't pay back. I say that, thus, I am a defaulter. I, I, I have gone bankrupt and I cannot pay you anything back. So that is where the risk of the bank comes in. That's the lending risk. That is precisely what we call the credit risk. Now, to do that, now, if the bank, while the bank is doing that, so let's imagine a scenario like this. That there are 200 deposit. So the total deposit in the bank is 2 lakhs. Now there is an entrepreneur who comes in asking for a loan. And the bank says, okay, take the loan of 2 lakhs. And you need to pay back to me by the end of next week or the end of next month with my interest and I'll, I'll make it. So the moment this happens, the entire money has been left out and the bank does not have a single pie with it. Now, let's assume that this person who took the loan does not pay back the money at all. So now what happens, uh, and now what is the scenario? The bank is in the state of a liquidation. The bank does not have any money to pay back the, I mean, pay back the depositors. So the bank, the bank does not have money to pay back the depositors and the bank Desperately now requires a bailout. So this is a very known scenario which we had seen previously. So that is where the story of the bank comes in. So first, the first question that we answer is that who whom to lend, right? So if I am lending out those two lakh rupees to a guy, I must know whether he is a good customer or a bad customer. And that is precisely the first part that CRM tries to answer. Who is the person to whom I should lend out? I should try, how should I try to identify whether he is a good borrower or a bad borrower? So that is where the story of application scorecard comes in. And that is where the story of entire scorecarding comes into play. And I ask that, okay, should I give this loan to this guy or not? How likely is this guy to be a good borrower? The moment I put in this question before giving out the loan, I am putting in a risk management control. Now, the question that comes in that, okay, he's a good guy, but should I lend out all the two lakh to him now? Everything is not under his control. Might be he's a diligent guy, but he's also faced with macroeconomic risks. What if, if he collapses as, or if his business collapses in the process before he pays back the money? Then I'll be in a liquidation risk. So that is where the second part of the module comes in, where we talk about the capital reservation techniques of the capital reservation requirements, which, which is nothing but other models, right? The capital adequacy, you know, how adequately a bank would be capitalized. So when I consider 
when I'm taking my capital and into consideration, I also need to consider the fact that this guy may not be gonna go serious stress scenario and he may not be able to pay back anything to me. How do I survive then? So that is the answer that the stress testing requirement or the stress testing regulations talk about. So this is where the entire story comes in. And this is where the entire uh, so they, these are the three basic questions that we try to answer. One, should I give out a loan to a borrower when he comes in? Second, if I give him the loan, how is he performing? If he is performing, he is not performing good. If he is like he is a dicey customer, a dicey application or a dicey account in the books of the bank, then I need to actually go back and check whether this person is capable of paying back the loans to me or not. So how do I go about doing that? Right. So, so over here, so over here, the next question that comes out to us is the following that first how is it that I do I know that where the person has been given the loan? So if he is given the loan, how is he performing? If he is a dicey customer, how much should I keep back against his name? Second is that, okay, how much of capital should I adequately set aside in order to prevent myself from all expected as well as unexpected losses? So these are the questions and at each, for each of these questions, we have each of the respective sections. So for the first part, we have the scorecards identifying whether a particular customer or a particular applicant should be given the loan or not. The next stage, we try to understand whether a particular account is performing good or bad. If he's performing good, then that's okay. If he's performing bad, how much of results should I set aside? How much should I keep aside to prevent myself against expected and unexpected losses? That's positive. And how would I perform under stress scenarios that is stress testing regulations? So these are the four broad areas where we would be taking the discussion to and we would be moving on one by one. Clear? Just over. So uh, is this part clear uh, where we uh, so like the overview and the approach of the module is this clear to you the PME Asif? Great. Now the next question comes in is why credit risk modeling? Why credit risk models? So this is the next thing that we need to understand. So what if, if there was no credit risk models and what where is the role that what is a gap that credit risk models or predictive models help us bridge. So basically, uh, all of us remember this Great Depression of the 1920s, right? So I would start the story right from 
So what used to happen in those days was that the people used to believe that, uh, you know, generally the law of demand is something which has been predominantly adhered to for all kind of economic activities, right? Where they say that the price of a commodity, price and the quantity demanded are negatively related, right? So price and the quantity demanded. And the quantity demanded are negatively related. So basically, if the cost of borrowing goes up, it was expected that the quantity demanded should also go up. I mean, quantity demanded should decrease. Yeah, it, it went just off. Sorry. So basically, it's it was it, it it has generally been believed that if you, I mean, the cost of borrowing, right, and the I mean the cost of the credit, and the de quantity demanded for the credit, will be very different from each other. Right? I mean, they are negatively related with each other. Right. So, so suppose if this is my quantity demanded, right? If this is my quantity demanded, this axis. So suppose if this is my quantity demanded, or the quantity of credit, and this is the rate of interest, I would generally expect a curve like this to happen. right a downward sloping demand curve to occur so basically at very high rate of interest the rate of the quantity demanded will be low and at relatively lower rate of interest the quantity demanded will be high because interest rate of interest is nothing but cost of borrowing so higher the cost is lower will be the extent of borrowing So this is where you have the cost of this is the cost of borrowing. So greater the cost of borrowing is lower is the quantity demanded, and lower the cost of borrowing is higher is the quantity demanded. So this is the principle. Uh, argument that economics always follows while rationing out credit as well. So basically, the bankers, uh, the classical bankers, were in the early 1900s. They were of the view that if you want to reduce credit in your economy, if you want to stringent, I mean, reduce the amount of the flow of credit in your economy to control the economic activities and be more conservative in your policy approaches, what you need to do is you need to raise the rate of interest. However, when they did that. They did not take into account or they did not take into consideration something called a private information. Right. So they did not take into account the case of the borrowers, the type of the borrowers who are coming in, because this class of economic theory that I'm talking about over here 
always assume that all the agents are more or less homogeneous in group. I mean, they, they are more or less similar in behavior and everything. But they did not consider the difference in the criteria or the, or the borrower type, which is a very uh, basic consideration these days. So any borrower could have been a good or a bad borrower. Right now, what was initially done was to prevent the increase in credit flow the rate of interests were increased right and they were set at very high levels of r equal to say r bar star so they were actually set at very high levels and it was actually seen that the quantity of credit fell but what happened was the change in the base of the borrowers who took the loan now when the rate of interest was very high people who were the diligent borrowers they stepped back from taking the loans because those who felt that they could not afford the loan at that such high rates of interest so they actually stepped back and they did not apply for and they, they moved out from the loan now people who took the loan who took the loan were actually of two types among the good people who took the loan they were the most or they were the best quality people However, in this strategy, they forgot to control for the second kind of group who were the bad borrowers. Now, there was a group of people who wanted to who took the loan just with the objective of flunking. Right? So, with this increasing the rate of interest without any other controls in place when the banks came to this strategy, it was seen that, they, that the people took huge amount of loans. I mean, I mean, out of the loans that were lent out huge amount of loans turned out to be bad loans right and as such the banking systems collapsed in 1929 so and which actually started collapsing in 1928 and then following 1929 the world entered into a recession and that recession went so bad that it persisted for seven long years until the general theory of income unemployment came out general theory of income interest and employment came out authored by John Maynard Keynes with who actually took the economy out of recession using demand driven policy that is a separate story so over here what was most important was the type of the borrowers were coming in and there was a huge amount of private information in it. suppose I go to bank to take the loan the bank sees that okay this is a guy who's coming to take the loan at this rate of interest so he must be a good guy he must have an affordability constraint but their behaviors were not actually looked into that much and the bankers looked into something ex uh, like exogenously and gave the loans to these people but these people were people who took the loan with the objective to be fine. not necessarily if a person always has the affordability he will always be a good borrower right say for example uh, in india you recently must have heard the stories of uh, Mr. Vijay, Dr. Vijay Malia uh, doing the rounds, right? So, who took a huge amount of loan from the banks and then he kind of bankrupt and moved out and is now residing out in the, the country. So, given this, or given this scenario, right? So, I, I cannot say that uh, the Malia group actually lacked any kind of affordability, lacked any kind of affordability, but they lacked in terms of their willingness to pay back. So, he was actually a bad borrower. So, the credit. So at the right at the acquisition stage, at the acquisition stage, in such a huge amount of loan is being passed, then it, it, it should be the case that this person is identified from somewhere or the other. So you must have an appropriate mechanism for deciding the optimal amount of loan that needs to be given out. So this is where, so this is where this role of credit risk models actually come in. Now, risk models proper appropriate accurate risk models put in place helps us identify the chances of a customer of being a good or a bad customer or uh, of, ident of helping us identify a good versus a bad borrower now this was previously absent in most of the classical lending practices which resulted in majority of the bank failures and the may the biggest bank failure being in 1929 which is obviously now changed and has been followed up by the 2008 financial crisis and the resulting banking crashes and the banks that crashed. 
Now over there, the story was a bit different. But if you look into the crux, you would see that what it lacked was the appropriate risk management principle. So basically, in 2008, so what created that 2008 financial crisis? It was the housing crisis, right? The subprime lending in the real estate sector. Now what? What what happened over there? What was the story over there? Over there, the people believe that that housing prices was such a commodity, and in this expanding economy, it would go out, go ahead for years. I mean, that would keep on increasing over the years. Now, I mean, basically, it's been seen that most of the economists have profound, have, they have like propagated the fact that if your economy is expanding, the first symbol you need to look out for is GDP, and then you look out for the real estate. You see that your real estate sector is growing. You know that your economy is also growing, right? So that's an indicator because with an increase in the economic activity, the average income of the people tend to increase, and following that, your housing prices tend to increase because demand for housing has increased, thereby pushing up the uh, real estate prices. So that's one story. However, every sector has its fundamental rate. Of growth, I cannot expect prices to just double in the next two years, uh, in the next two months, and then triple in the next one month, and then go ahead, go way beyond in the next six months. And in the next six months, you see that your prices have doubled, uh, house prices have gone up by 250 300 percent. That's not a feasible growth rate. So if you see something is growing much more than its fundamental rate, you know that there is some abnormality in it. And that excess growth above the fundamental growth rate is called the bubble growth or the existence of a bubble over there. Because like bubble growth that they are hollow, they grow and then at a point they burst and to get back to your fundamentals and in between a huge amount of wealth is lost. So what happens, what, what happened over there was the bankers, they fed that, they fed that, okay. The house prices are going exactly, exactly as well. it's uh, too much money chasing too few assets. So, uh, in literature, if you look into, uh, I mean, there is a huge literature which talks about the fad theory. So, where where people like like I see you buying it, and thereby I feel that if I don't buy it, I might stand to lose. If I mean, I I would gain if you gain, but like, uh, I mean, sorry, if you lose, I also lose. But if you gain, then I would feel humiliated, right? Because I did not buy that asset. So other than taking that chance, I just go and buy that asset. So that's the way a bubble actually operates. It, 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 it is blown up by your existence of, you know, hard behavior, then fat behavior and people chasing everyone in a hurting manner and artificial prices going up and up. So that's a separate story. Let's not get into that at this point of time. It's a huge area. So what happened over there was that uh, the bankers they felt that housing prices would go up for years and they would not, not and they would never be, uh, uh, you know, a market correction. So the lending was actually done on the basis of houses, right? So today the house price is say two lakh rupees a, a house. And two weeks down the line, that turns out to four lakh rupees. So that's the rate at which house prices were growing at that point of time. And they've always felt that okay, even if I give a loan to this underprivileged person who does not have the income affordable to come in, you would default, I would just take that house and sell it up in the market. And without the gaga, the market is going over. I'll just make it through. But there was the problem. The, there would be a point where the housing prices would turn back. And there would be a mean reversing trend. And the moment this trend happened, the housing prices crashed. When the market suddenly realized that they were just paying, they were just not overpaying, but they were overpaying manifolds. And hence, they felt that it was not required. And there was a market correction. The market felt the house price was overpriced. And then, once the housing prices, I mean, once the housing prices went to market correction, the housing prices collapsed. And it came back to the fundamentals and the people who had taken the loan, they could not pay back the money. In any way they would not be able, they would not be paying it back. So there was a huge PD already there, the way it was booked. But the assurance was that the LGD would not be very high. That is the loss given default would not be high because the housing houses the 
house could be sold off and that money could be made out. However, that did not happen and again, the banks went on a crash. And this time the global collapse was so high, it was such a crash that the entire globe had to pay the price for it because, I mean, had it been solely restricted to the US or the UK, that would not have been the challenge. But this time it was the investment bankers who were also playing a big role. And they were creating out uh, like derivatives and they were creating out these special purpose vehicles from these toxic loans and were selling, selling off them as instruments all across the world. So that crisis, the impact of that crisis that happened over there, that exploded across the globe. And that is where this entire challenge came up. And the entire world entered into a financial crisis. So the moment this crisis happened, now the regulators become very stringent about the fact that okay, there is so huge bailouts that we had to do, and the American taxpayers' money is gone, and the crisis cost registered to somewhere around 13.4 trillion dollars in US. So the massive, this was a massive hit on the taxpayers' revenues, and huge amount of bailouts had to be done. So now. Standing into this interlinked global framework, interlinked global financial framework, we believe that it was not time that the bank should turn around. Right? It was not as if that they did not realize previously, but now they felt that they, they, their heart was a little more. So they felt that no, we must do something right now. Right? So we have been bankrupted, and the next time it happens, we are just going to run out of money. Our taxpayers are going no, 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 not going to just go for us, and that. That is where the entire challenge arose and from there you have the next level of the story arising and where you have a region, a regime of regulations coming in. You have a very stringent focus on scorecards. Now, now the regulators are very cautious of the fact that every bank must have the scorecards, uh, every bank must have their, you know, their uh, statistical models in place. They have to use the most conservative methods. They cannot use the black box method. And, and all sort of these regulations. And it was not that scorecards did not prevail before 2008. They, they were there, right? But it was not a there. So it was not regulated. No one was there to see the regulation. But once the world, like the world saw the effects of this crisis, that is where they felt that, no, we need to do something about it. And that is where, and that is where we have this increasing demand for these credit risk. Uh, models coming in, and we look to and look forward, and we think that yes, there is huge increase in demand, and we have all sort of regulations starting to coming after that. So people suddenly realize all of a one point morning that there was something called a Basel Accord, which was there, which has been sh shed up like into the darkness for years when they were into their malpractices of lending. So they suddenly realize that they needed something called a stress testing regulation prevent banks to guide the world to global banking model. Then they suddenly realized they needed something called a IFRS 9, a financial reporting standard, where things will be coming out more conservative, provisions will be more conservative, which was not there perhaps. Uh, I mean, so IFRS 9 existed even before, right? IFRS 9 nothing but the uh, International Accounting Standard Codes, IA, the regulations. So that's how. A specific regulation, provisional regulation, which comes up from the IAS. So, fast financial accounting standard boards, they were there even before 2008. But all these regulations, they did not exist. Right. So basically, these regulations they came out after this financial crisis happened, and the entire idea was to make the banks sufficiently capitalized, adequately capitalized in the case that even when the there was a macroeconomic crisis or a macroeconomic downturn, the banks could pull off their existence. They should not become, you know, and they should not become uh, liquidated. I mean, they should not in liquidation phase. 
like the case that had happened for Lehman Brothers, right? So Lehman Brothers was a globally systematically important financial institution.